so dominate life on Earth, I'm sorry, microbiologists, that we tend to take them for granted. At least visual life, visual life. If you took away all the things that were multicellular in this room, we would have Julia. Zing. Okay, so um, nonetheless, the first steps in this transition remain poorly understood, right? Uh, man, you totally threw off my whole open monologue here. <laughs> We're used to thinking about aggregates of millions, billions, even trillions of cells all working together towards a common goal as an individual. Yet our comfort with multicellular individuality obscures the fact that the transition from a single celled way of life to a multi celled way of life marks a radical shift in life's structure and function. Nonetheless, the first steps in this transition remain poorly understood. See, I skipped to that earlier. Largely because multicellularity hasn't evolved that many times and all known transitions are ancient. But it's precisely those first steps, from unicellularity to nascent multicellularity, that I'll be focusing on in this talk. I think we can all agree, hey, can we get the lights in the front of the room? That the uh, best way to study the origin of multicellularity would be to, this is fine, this is fine, would be to get into a hot tub time machine, right? Go back 600 million years and observe this transition as it's happening. Unfortunately, Hollywood lied to us, and this isn't actually a real thing, it's just, just a movie. Uh, and if I had a time machine, I would probably go see like T-Rex or that you know, 50 foot white shark uh, anyway, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at little balls of cells. But this would be the best way to study the origin of multicellularity. Since we can't do that, we're doing the next best thing. Oh yeah. Sorry, this computer is really, really slow. There we go. Ah, oh, man. I knew this would happen. All right, so we are trying to do essentially time travel in a test tube. We work with uh, yeast, Baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is a unicellular uh, fungus, and we experimentally evolve multicellularity from that ancestor. And what you're looking at here is what we call snowflake yeast reproducing in a 16-hour time lapse uh, in the lab. And we got this by exerting a very simple selective pressure in the lab. We select for rapid sedimentation through liquid media. Clusters of cells settle faster than single cells, so if there are mutations which create clusters, those are strongly favored by natural selection. Now, once clusters evolve, there is a really rapid shift in the level of selection to, from among cell selection to among cluster selection. And this is because, because whole clusters either make it to the bottom of the tube and survive, or fail to do so and perish. And this results in a really interesting phenomenon. We see cluster level adaptation in response to cluster level selection. If we select for faster settling, we get bigger bodied yeast. If we select for slower settling, we get smaller bodied yeast. But perhaps the most intriguing, oh yeah, sorry. And in fact, what this is, this, is, this highlights sort of the key procedural shift in evolutionary process that underlies the origin of multicellularity. Once selection is acting among groups of cells, and those groups of spells, cells respond to that selection via sort of cluster level adaptation, then they have made the evolutionary transition to multicellularity in the sense that they are evolving in the same way that all multicellular organisms evolve. But perhaps the most interesting multicellular adaptation that we see in our system is higher rates of programmed cell death. Our early snowflake yeast have very low rates of programmed cell death, but it evolves repeatedly in all of our, in all of our lineages, which will evolve to form large clusters. And in fact, I'm not gonna talk much about this today, but we've shown that this is adaptive. These cells that are giving up their lives actually allow the cluster to do something better. They allow the cluster to sort of regulate the number and size of offspring that they're producing because those cell, the cells that die become the focal point for the next, for, for uh, the scission of propagules. When the cell dies, the propagule that it's sort of at the base of floats away. Uh, the little movie is a, is a really funky movie of a single cluster that is splitting at the juncture between two dead cells. I'm going to get a better movie soon, but that's the best I could do with the equipment I had at the time. And this is a, a snowflake yeast cluster stained with a blue cell wall fluorescent stain. And you can see this isn't just a jumble of cells. In fact, these cells are attaching to each other via a very specific geometry. In fact, daughter cells remain attached to their mother cells after mitosis. There's no sort of stickiness. Cells don't just bump into each other and adhere. When we look at the uh, gene expression between our unicellular ancestor and our first snowflake yeast, out of the thousands of significant differences in gene expression, the single largest one was a knockdown in CTS1, 
which is an endokinase required for daughter cell separation after mitosis, which makes sense given this, this growth form that I show you here. And when we sequence these guys, we find, in fact, that there's a single SNP right in sort of the business end of a transcription factor, ACE2, which turns on and off CTS1. And in fact, so what we think is happening is that this, this transcription factor is being knocked out by this SNP, and we can recapitulate uh, the snowflake yeast phenotype by simply knocking out ACE2 in our wild type ancestor. And critically, we can take experimentally evolved snowflake yeast, put a functional copy of ACE2 back in, and we get unicellular yeast again, which happens to be a very, very handy uh, experimental technique for our research. So then we continue to evolve these guys over thousands of generations in the lab. What you're looking at here is about 1,000 generations of adaptation, and we find that our yeast evolved to settle faster and faster. Turns out that one way that they do this, it's very simple, they evolve to form bigger clusters that contain more cells. At every step here, they've increased the number of cells per group. But they also evolve more massive cells. We get a single sort of one-off step right here in between these two time points where cell size increases by more than twofold, which results in faster settling because you build bigger clusters as a result of having bigger cells. But as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, they settle faster and faster and faster, but they begin to push up against a constraint. That is, large clusters don't grow as fast as small clusters, largely because the cells on the inside are becoming resource limited. They have to wait for resources to diffuse past a bunch of hungry yeast, and by the time it gets to the internal cells, there's not much left. So in fact, if we go way out here to about 1,000 generations, rather than just getting bigger, we find that our snowflake yeast also get more efficient. They evolve to be more spherical, more hydrodynamic, and they settle about a third faster per increase in, in mass than the, than the previous strains. So they're actually changing the architecture of the group in, re, in response to these sort of conflicting selection pressures, faster settling, but also fast growth. So I think it's pretty clear that snowflake yeast are pretty good Darwinian individuals in the sense that they evolve as, as multicellular wholes. So how do they do this? One of the main things that multicellular organisms one of the main challenges they face in, in, in becoming multicellular is figuring out how to quell genetic conflict. How do you solve the problem of the cells within an organism being competitors rather than cooperators? To put it another way, why should a cell give up their own life for the sake of their brethren? brethren right? Why should my skin cell give up its own reproductive self-interest to help the rest of my cells and my body do well? So it turns out, I think we can answer this question, and it has to do with the very peculiar geometry of snowflake yeast. So here's a single cell at time zero. If we allow that cell to divide, it has an offspring in blue. We can allow them to both divide, and again, and again. And I'm actually drawing this kind of true to form. This is the way that snowflake yeast grow. And one of the nice things about this is this is a binomial expansion in cell number, but it's spatially localized such that the distribution of cells in this cluster should be predicted by Pascal's triangle. That is, the basal cell in purple, there's one at every time point. It's had four offspring in blue. It should have six grandchildren, four great-grandchildren, and one red great-great-grandchild. So we can test this in the lab. We made a very simple predictive model where you input the number of cells in the cluster. Here there's 16. We then use that to figure out the number of doublings that that cell has gone through. And then we use the Pascal triangle approach to figure out, to predict how those cells should be arranged in the cluster. And in fact, the model is a little more complex because it, has to, it, it can account for partial doublings. Uh, but nonetheless, we tested this on a bunch of snowflake yeast from different time points. Uh, and even after about 1,000 generations of adaptation, we found a very nice fit to our model. Our yeast grow in a very simple geometric pattern, this binomial expansion in space, which, is, which turns out is really nice because this growth form solves some of the major hurdles associated with the transition to multicellularity. One thing that happens is that every single time a snowflake yeast cluster reproduces, it undergoes a single cell genetic bottleneck, right? So if you imagine that you have these chains of cells, if you break the connection between two cells, like right here, you have a basal cell, I've, made, I've marked it zero prime, and that basal cell is connected to its daughters, its granddaughters, its great granddaughters, but it's only connected to offspring that are clonal descendants of itself. So if we have this sort of chimeric cluster here, we could break off branches from anywhere in it, and we're going to get an offspring that is essentially uniclonal. We can contrast this to a different sort of, or I should say that this snowflake yeast growth form in the literature is generally referred to as clonal development. 
And this should sound familiar. In fact, that's what people think just development is, because it's so ubiquitous among multicellular organisms. But there are some multicellular organisms that undergo aggregative development, where free living cells come together to form a group of cells that, that then does something cool, like dictostelium. Uh, and so in yeast, aggregative development is sort of like flocculation. These cells make adhesive proteins on their cell walls, and when they bump into one another, they adhere. And we expect that in an aggregative developer, you should get genetically diverse offspring because they're just kind of ripping apart and sticking back together. You don't have this geometric structure forcing these single cell genetic bottlenecks. So it turns out that, these, that this genetic uniformity that's, that's caused by single cell genetic bottlenecks pretty much solves the problem of genetic conflict, of cheating cells that do something that is costly to the group as a whole but beneficial to themselves. Right? If we have this uh, sort of chimeric group here where the green cells are cheats and they're doing something which is advantageous for themselves but costly to the whole group, when that thing reproduces, you'll either get a lineage of, of, of cooperative cells, which are now sort of free from further parasitism, or you get a lineage of cheating cells, which are not going to do much on their own, right? They have no one to cheat. It turns out that these bottlenecks also maximize the variance in fitness among whole groups. And that turns out to be really important. So let's say now that we have a beneficial mutation, not a cheater, but something which is good. In this case, it's larger cell size, right? Bigger cells is great because it results in faster settling clusters. If we have our snowflake cluster, we can break this in many different ways, but we're always going to end up with a genetically uniform offspring. If this, if this mutation occurs in the context of one of our aggregative developers, like flocculating yeast, we could get single cell bottlenecks, but in fact, that's probably pretty rare. We're mostly going to get genetically diverse offspring. And this turns out to be important because the higher the frequency of big cell mutants in your cluster, the faster you're going to settle, which is, again, what we're selecting for, right? And so natural selection can really favor this big cell mutation when every cell in the group has the big cell mutation. So in fact, we can, we can model out these two scenarios uh, here a little more explicitly, and we can, and we can use uh, Stokes' Laws calculations to figure out how fast these things should settle. We can put that into a model where we predict fitness. Um, and nonetheless, what we find is that for the, for the snowflake guy here, they either make 50% of very large propagules, sorry, very fast settling propagules, and 50% very slow settling propagules. And that's a, there's a huge variance in fitness there, right? Natural selection can easily act on that difference. Whereas for our aggregative guys, these guys down here, most of them resemble their parents, but in fact, and, and very few uh, are, are, are sort of divergent from that sort of parental settling speed. So this, this, this very simple geometric body plan also allows selection to act on the cluster level consequences of nearly every de novo mutation that arises in our populations, which is very, very powerful. And so uh, Jen Pence, a PhD student in my lab, is actually just beginning to test some of these ideas experimentally. So we can take flocculating yeast. In fact, uh, she assayed a uh, strain library for naturally occurring flock strains and found five that settle really, really well. We took those five into the lab, and we basically just redid our main experiment, selecting for fast settling. Now, keep in mind, these flock yeasts are totally pre-adapted to this environment. They settle really fast. They don't need to evolve into snowflakes to settle any faster. So I thought really nothing would happen. They might get a little better at settling, but, but over time they would remain flock. That's not what happened. In 36 of our 40 populations, snowflake yeast ero arose in that flock background and then subsequently drove flock to extinction. So within our experimental environment, snowflake yeast are, are evolutionarily superior. And so uh, her future work is, is essentially trying to use a sort of synthetic biology approach to create both of these different aggregate, both aggregative and clonal development from a single common genetic background and begin to disentangle hypotheses about proximate benefits. It's just better to be a snowflake because you set a little faster from ultimate evolutionary benefits. It's better to be a, slow, a snowflake because you can optimize your multicellular characteristics to really take advantage of that environment. And she has a poster here. I'm putting her on the spot. So think of some really hard questions and then go ask them to her uh, tonight at the poster session. Five. Oh, man. All right. So this is going to be quick, I think. It's been 15 minutes already? Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs>
So we're interested in how morphological, I'm going to go through a few questions that I, I think are fascinating. How does morphological complexity arise, right? We have traits like big cells, apoptosis, rounder clusters. One thing we're doing is a, a lot of sort of mathematical modeling, both in two and three dimensions, as well as building simulation models to see how these traits arise and specifically how they interact with each other to create more complex multicellular structures. We're also essentially doing the molecular genetics. We've evolved these things already, right? So we can use bulk segment analysis approaches to try and get at the genes. We can build pipelines to identify what the specific loci are that are statistically associated with these traits. And then we can synthetically create snowflake yeast with and without these traits in any combination that we want, allowing us to really test the predictions of our models. This is work being done by Jordan, uh, a new PhD student in my lab, and Parim Devi, a bioinformatics master's student. We can look at things like sex. How does sex affect the transition to multicellularity? Clonal evolution is not a very efficient way of evolving relative to sex. And in fact, most multicellular organisms are sexual. So we know that sex creates diversity. It should create diversity in multicellular traits, perhaps resulting in faster adaptation. We tested this, again, sort of using sex in our system. We evolved our yeast without sex. However, what we can do is take our yeast, we can put a single, oh, what did I do? We can put a single clone through tens of thousands of rounds of parallel, parallel rounds of sex. So one clone goes through sex tens of thousands of times, but all, all at exactly the same time. And then we can compare the fitness of that post-sex population to the pre-sex ancestor. And then we subtract the two. So, so for, the, for our unicellular ancestor, sex provided zero benefit at all. That's why there's a zero there. But for snowflake yeast, it provided a substantial benefit. And importantly, the more time they had to be a snowflake yeast, the more complex they were. By the end there, they have programmed cell death, they have large cluster size, they have changes in the morphology of individual cells, the larger a benefit sex provided. And as a control, of course, we took our, unis our, our unicellular ancestor, same ancestor, and evolved it for the same length of time without sex, sorry, without, uh, without selection for multicellularity, so it stayed unicellular. And for it, sex actually provided a slight cost. Not a benefit, a small yet statistically significant cost. This is work, again, being done by Jen and Leslie Townsell, a master's student at Clark Atlanta, who's doing her thesis in my lab. I'm going to skip this. Finally, <laughs> we're also working with Clement Demonis, asking, can we re-evolve the Volvox? I think this is uh, a really audacious question. I don't think it's possible, at least not in the time frame that we have. Volvox is a fantastic unicellular algae. It has germ somewhat differentiation. It swims around. It has light spots. It's a cool organism. It evolved back in the Cretaceous, 200 million years ago. This is early dinosaur times, right? We're talking the origin of dinosaurs. And that's when this guy evolved from an ancestor like Clamidomonas. But we're using rotifers All right. to see. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> That's right. <laughs> to see if we can select for multicellularity in Chlamydomonas. And rotifers are a fantastic organism for many reasons. <laughs> I spelled it wrong? <laughs> Rough. It. Yeah. <laughs> I think I have to tie the drink ticket now, right? <laughs> so the Roftipers uh, <laughs> have a small mouth. And they can consume single-celled algae, but they cannot consume clusters. So we selected on these for a year and a half. And by me, I mean my collaborator, Matt Heron, at the University of Montana. And three of these are algae that we evolved in the lab. And three of them are naturally occurring vulvacine algae. Give yourself a few seconds to try and pick which ones we evolved and which ones are isolated from lakes around the world. Turns out we evolved those ones uh, on the left. And in fact, we find that there are very strong predictions about how multicellularity should evolve in this lineage. And we're finding that the same predicted trajectory of traits uh, that, that, that we think actually happened in nature are happening in our test tubes, which is very cool. That's Matt. And with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators, our lab, and our funding agencies. And I'll take one or two questions. One. One question from a graduate student. <laughs> Sorry, from a graduate student.